It's 4 a.m. I'm asleep in the deepest reaches of the Central American jungle. There's a noise outside my door. The door opens. And there's a stranger standing in the doorway. He's got a long, scraggly beard. He's got long, blonde hair. Honestly, he looks like Jesus Christ. <laughs> if Jesus Christ was a surfer. And he speaks to me, he says, with an Australian accent, are you fit tonight? I say, yes. He says, your wife's having a big in it. You gotta get out of here. At this point, I'm freaking out. I'm in full panic mode. Because I am in Costa Rica on the Osa Peninsula. I am 7,000 kilometers and three flights from Melissa. Listen, you can't be farther away than that. That's as remote as I was. And this guy is telling me that my baby is coming five weeks early. And the worst part of this whole situation, I'm at a bachelor party. <laughs> With Melissa's permission, I swear. <laughs> but I am completely off the grid. It is really a miracle that Aussie Jesus has tracked me down. <laughs> I figure he, he relates to me. He's like, oh no, your wife got in touch of your buddy's fiance, and then your fiance tracked me down. I'm a yoga instructor in the village next door, and I hustled through the jungle, and I started knocking on doors until I found you. Now, at this point, I am really, really hoping this is just a nasty prank the bachelor party is trying to play on me. <laughs> so I grab the nearest cell phone I, I can find that has brilliant capability. It's not my phone, it's someone else's. And I run down to the beach because that's the only place you can pick up a signal where I am. And I literally have to wade out into the water to get a signal. And I call my wife. She picks up and she confirms it's all true. Her water broke the night before, and that morning, as she got to the hospital, she'd been trying every connection she could, she could to get a hold of me. And then she says the thing that crushes me. She's like, don't worry, I've called my best friend, Alex. She'll be there to be my birthing partner. And my heart falls out into the ocean and drifts away. <laughs> But then we switch gears, we, we start talking logistics, and, you know, my wife's a sharpshooter, she's already figured out, like, how to rebook all my flights, so all I have to do at that point is get to San Jose, Costa Rica, the capital city, by noon that day, to catch my flights out to the United States, and, well, I'm only in the middle of the jungle, I mean, let's face it, the odds are against me, right, but I'm pressing on. So, I race up the hill from the water, I go back to the cabin, I grab all my crap, I put it in the bag, I run further up to this dirt road, literally we're on a dirt road in the jungle, and I'm just hoping to God something shows up, and thank God something shows up. There's a truck coming down the road, and I hitch a ride down the dirt road for an hour in the back of a truck to the local airstrip, where I happen to find a plane with eight seats. I get one of the eight seats on this single propeller plane, the only flight of the day out of the jungle back to San Jose, Costa Rica. And I'm flying on this plane, we're dodging thunderstorms, and I'm getting so sick, I can't even tell you, it's the most turbulent ride ever, but we land. And I get out of that plane, and I grab my stuff all queasy, and I run from the local airport, and jogging and sweaty, and I run to the international terminal, and it's about a kilometer away, and I get in the international terminal, and I realize I'm booked on a flight to Houston, to New York, but there is a direct flight to New York, but it's fully booked. But I feel like I should go try my luck. So I approach the gate agent and I make my case. And then I have a real awkward moment of self-realization. I look and smell like a guy who has just spent the last two days at a bachelor party in the jungle. <laughs> I'm a hot mess. And on top of all that, I am weaving crazy stories, feverishly to this woman across from me about pregnant ladies in New York and how my wife's about to give birth. And I can tell, I am hardly the first crazy person she's encountered. She's well practiced in this place. And the verdict is in, and I am not getting on any planes in New York. So I board the flight to Houston. 
uneventfully we land at 5 p.m. I get on the phone with my wife, and I'm trying to run to the flights and go to LaGuardia, and I'm on the phone, and you know what? We're claiming the victory, man. I've gotten back to the United States. Things are going really well, right? I mean, we're actually, you know, we've been like a hive mind for the past 12 hours, just connecting, and, you know, we're telling Joe, and I'm telling her, please squeeze your legs together, keep that baby in. And she's like, all the nurses are taking bets on whether you're going to make it here or not. And Things are great, and finally I get on a plane, the plane shoves off at 6.30 p.m., we're about to take off, and oh, it turns from warmth to terror as I look out the window, and there's a thunderstorm approaching the Houston airport, the sky darkens, and literally a lightning bolt crashes 50 feet off the side of the plane. And everyone else is freaked out on the plane, but I am just like, I give up. I give up. And we spend 90 minutes on the tarmac, and the plane finally takes off at 8.30 p.m. And those last three and a half hours are easily the worst part of the entire trip because it's being so close. We've been closing the distance this entire time, but that three and a half hours of not knowing if you're actually going to make it in time. Just not knowing. There's nothing you can do. Half past midnight, the plane touches down in LaGuardia. I say a small prayer to Australian Jesus. <laughs> I pick up the phone, call my wife. Baby, he's still inside. Hustle out, get the taxi. 16 minutes from LaGuardia to Sinai Sinai Hospital. I am by my wife's side 21 hours and three flights later from being notified by Australian Jesus. 7 to 2 a.m., Billy Fitzpatrick is born. Oh.